So who knows who's on the 50 cent coin? Who is it? Kennedy, that is right. Uh, I thought that was, so actually in the second service, I do this regularly, I ask a, a question during greeting time because it just flows easily. Uh, and as I thought of a question this week, I, I thought that was a good one. I was like, man, it'd be great to have a, a 50 cent coin. Uh, today we're looking at a passage that talks about uh, taxes and, and giving uh, what to Caesar, the, all that belongs to him. And I thought, man, uh, it's not every day you just get a, a 50 cent piece. I didn't have any laying around and actually I had a chance to go to the Ohio State game yesterday and I got one uh, bottle of Powerade while I was uh, watching this game and the guy tosses me a 50 cent piece and I was like, wow, God works in funny ways. I haven't had a 50 cent piece and I don't know how long, but walked away with one um, and was fitting. I don't know that there's much spiritual implication there, but you never know, I guess. Uh, Mark 12 is where we're at. I uh, invite you to turn there in the Bible uh, that you have with you. If you didn't bring one, there's one in the pew back in front of you. Mark 12, verses 13 to 17. Uh, as you're turning there, I'll just uh, speak a word of prayer for us. Well, Father God, uh, we sit here now with our Bibles open, uh, your word in front of us, and God, we trust it to be true. Uh, and we thank you for uh, providing it for us. We just pray that you would help us to uh, understand it rightly and uh, to handle it in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask that you just shape our minds and our hearts uh, according to what we see. Uh, so God, just ask for this time that you just uh, anoint me with the Spirit to speak uh, all that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, if, if you haven't been with us prior to the last few weeks, just catch you up real quickly and uh, remind you that uh, we're, we're kind of walking through the gospel of Mark. Uh, started at the very beginning, going all the way uh, through chapter 16. So we started out with John the Baptist uh, stepping on the stage and welcoming Jesus. Uh, he was preparing the way for the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus came, he was baptized, he was driven into the, the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. Uh, he stood up against that temptation and went out, uh, did many m uh, miraculous works in front of the people, uh, engaged people in different ways, went in and, and taught uh, God's Word boldly, mostly in, in the synagogues and every place that he went to, uh, was experiencing some persecution or opposition along the way, people kind of challenging and, and questioning him. Uh, and then about uh, chapter 8, we saw that finally somebody identified Jesus for who he truly was. Peter came along and Jesus asked who he was, and he identified him as the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus is excited, yes, they've got it. Uh, so he kind of, we see a shift in the Gospel of Mark at that point to head towards Jerusalem. Uh, and then a, a few weeks back, we looked at Jesus getting into Jerusalem for the first time uh, in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, he goes into the temple. He sees that what was meant to be a house of prayer for God was turned into a den of robbers. It's just this place that uh, people are exchanging goods. There's really not much worship happening there. So Jesus is upset. Uh, he, he's driving people out. He's tipping tables over. Uh, we saw him curse a fig tree that we know is kind of just resembling... Uh, 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 Israel and, and God's judgment on it, that on the outside it looked fruitful and, and good, but uh, as you got closer, you realized there wasn't really much substance there. Uh, after Jesus does this, at the end of chapter 11, the beginning of chapter 12, which we actually kind of skipped over, uh, Jesus' authority starts to be questioned. People are coming up to him and they're asking him, by whose authority are you doing these things? Who do you think you are that you can go into the temple and drive people out? That you can go into God's place and tell people that they need to leave? Who are you and by whose authority are you uh, operating? Uh, he, you know, he withered the fig tree. By whose name are you doing these things? Uh, and you can see here at the, the end of chapter 11, as they ask Jesus this, he asks them one question. He says, well, first, let me ask you a question. Uh, John the Baptist, was he baptized by God or was he baptized by man? Uh, and they, they kind of get together, the, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, they, they put their heads together and they're like, ah, we're, we're kind of in a bind here because if we say that uh, John the Baptist was baptized by God, 
then that means that Jesus is probably really the Messiah, and we should be seeking after him, but we're not doing that. Uh, so they, they couldn't really do that too easily, and they knew that if they said John the Baptist was baptized by man, uh, that they would upset all the people who were there with Jesus, and, and those people would hate them because uh, all the people believed that John the Baptist really was a prophet. So they're, they're in this uh, hard place, and they go back to Jesus, and they're like, eh, I don't know. Well, we're not sure. We don't know what to tell you. Uh, they just kind of stay right on the fence safely, and Jesus tells them, well, then neither am I going to tell you by uh, whose authority I do these things uh, after that. Uh, we see a parable spoken against those leaders. Uh, so you can kind of see throughout the gospel this opposition to Jesus has been building. And, and I've mentioned a couple times, as we get into Jerusalem, it's really it's like the pressure cooker. You know, these, these people are really coming against Jesus. He's feeling the pressure. Uh, all these people in positions of authority want to see him uh, dethroned or, or s destroyed because he's starting to threaten their position of authority to do what they want to do. So that's the, the environment that we see ourselves in today as, as we prepare to read this, 12, 13 uh, through 17. We see Jesus and these authorities are, are really butting heads. Uh, so let's see the text that we have today and see what uh, God might have for us. Verse 13, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and they said to Jesus, teacher, we know that you are true and you don't care about anyone's opinion for you're not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they brought him one, and he said to them, Whose likeness, whose inscription is this? They said to him, It's Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they began marveling at him. So we see here these... Uh, Pharisees, the Herodians, they're gathering together with the, the, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, and they think, uh, they plot out this plan. We're just going to ask Jesus what he thinks about these taxes, because uh, this poll tax was relatively new. It was about 25 years old at this point, but it was a hot-button issue. There was a lot of division with it. Uh, the religious people felt that uh, you shouldn't participate in it. Obviously, the government people, the, pl the politicians, believed you should support it. And, and remember, they want to see D Jesus destroyed, so they think, we'll just go ask him what he thinks about these taxes. Uh, and then if he answers yes, you should pay the taxes, all the religious people are going to be upset and they're going to come against him because they don't think you should pay it. If he says no, then the government's going to come against him because uh, that's treason. He has to pay the taxes. He can't overthrow the government. So they think we'll put Jesus in this hard spot. Uh, and just to uh, kind of describe the, the understanding that the religious people have, uh, Josephus, who's one of the primary historians of the first century, he recorded this about one of the religious leaders. Uh, one of the religious leaders said this. He says, My fellow countrymen are cowards for being willing to pay tribute to the Romans and for putting up with mortal masters in place of God. So you can see here, that's kind of the mindset that these religious people have. If, if, you're a, if you're giving this money to Caesar, you're a coward because you're giving it back to these mortal masters uh, who are trying to exist in the place of God. Uh, see, they're keeping their, their finances and how they serve the government and their religious uh, practices completely separate. They don't mix very well. Uh, so, so this is what they're throwing in front of Jesus. What's your position on this? And maybe you notice that uh, this is the same tactic that I, I just mentioned Jesus used uh, back in chapter 11, verse 27. You can see it. The, the people went up to Jesus and they say, uh, John's baptism, was it from God or was it from man? They give them, uh, or, or that's what Jesus turns and asks them. Was it from God or was it from man? He gives them two options and it just stalled them out. They weren't able to respond and they're, they're coming fresh off of that and thinking, wow. Man, we'll just let Jesus give a shot at this approach. Taxes, do we pay them or not? 
what do you think, Jesus? Uh, and, and Jesus, you know, he doesn't clam up in the same way, does he? He doesn't uh, just stall out and say, I, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, how does Jesus respond? Jesus, seeing their hypocrisy, why do you put me to the test? He speaks right through it and asks them, why do you put me to the test? I think we could stop here and call this point one. Did you see what Jesus did? He wasn't fooled for an instant. He jumped right into it, and I think this is what we learn, and that is that our deceitful strategies cannot conceal the intent of our heart from God. Our deceitful strategies cannot conceal the intent of our heart from God. That's what this man is trying to do here, really. They're just trying to come up with some deceitful strategy when the intent of their heart is completely different. They think we're going to go up to Jesus and uh, speak to him all nice. Jesus, you are truly a man of God. You, you don't care what people think. You just speak what God uh, knows to be true. We respect you for that, and we want to know your thoughts on taxes. They don't want to know about taxes. They wanted Jesus to be destroyed by ever, whichever group became upset at his response. So that's really what they're after. And, and really, this isn't about the Pharisees and the Herodians who are here asking him the question. Because if we look in verse 13, it says, They sent to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians. Who are they? Well, they goes back to the previous conversation that was in the end of chapter 11. The scribes, the elders the chief priests. They're sending these Pharisees and uh, these, these other Herodians, the political people, they're sending them to sort of do the dirty work and to have Jesus uh, brought to destruction. But the real issue has very little to do with taxes. Uh, this, this issue from the Pharisees and Herodians, you could go back all the way to chapter 3 of Mark, chapter 3, verse 6, and you'll see that Jesus had just performed a, a miraculous event and the Pharisees and the Herodians, it says they left that place and they immediately held counsel with one another as to how they could destroy Jesus. So from the very beginning of this gospel, we've seen this uh, intent of their heart that this man needs to be destroyed. Uh, and they just, uh, they received Jesus' answer. Why do you test me? He's speaking to their hearts. And I began to wonder as I looked at this, uh, this week, you can actually see on your, on your bulletin, the, the title's probably Don't Take the Bait or something like that. And if I'm honest, uh, I didn't know what I was going to speak about when I gave that title to Jenny Thursday, uh, just wrestling with this text, and uh, the title doesn't apply. Uh, I took it a completely different direction. I, I think the title should probably be The Heart of the Issue, uh, because as, as I looked at this, you know, I, I was hearing what Jesus was saying and putting ourselves in, in his shoes, and we see the world comes up to us, and they try and bring division. You know, they kind of try to, to, to deceive us, uh, just like Jesus was being deceived. But then I looked at it the other way and put myself in the shoes of the Herodians and the Pharisees, and uh, as I was marveling at how foolish these men were, not even recognizing who they were talking to, I recognized that oftentimes... I think I would be right there with them, and probably still today am right there with them, and I invite you to consider whether maybe there are times that we go to God, we go to Jesus with some deceitful strategies when the intent of our heart is really something completely different. Now, as I, I wrestled with what these examples might be in my life, I, I thought of those personally. I, I'll share just a few examples maybe to give you an idea of what I'm thinking of here. Uh, so for our younger people, maybe uh, you're going to go off to college one day um, or you'll just graduate high school and, and some of your friends, maybe even still, uh, you know, not have to be a, a high school or college student. Some of your friends want to go to the bars and you think, well, yeah, I, sh I should probably go with them if I want to have any chance of preserving a relationship so that I can at some point minister uh, out of my faith or, or lead them to Christ. You know, I, I need to restore this bridge. I need to keep a good relationship. So I think I'll just go out with them this weekend. 
Now, that could be true. You may really want to preserve some relationship, and as you go, you're honoring God and all of your behavior, but I know that I've heard that example from many people, and I don't think there's really uh, much honesty in the claim that uh, I want to go out on the weekend with my friends so that I can build a bridge to lead them to Christ. That's just how we dress it up so that we justify it in our minds. The real intent is we just want to go out and have a good time. Uh, Another example, my wife and I talk about having a pond sometimes. You know, we like water. Uh, The kids would love the water year-round. There's all kinds of ways you can justify that. Uh, So so we want a pond, but, you know, that kind of costs some money. So we think about having a pond, and we can start saying, well, uh, if if we dig a pond, we could have people from church over. We could, you know, facilitate some Christian community. And you see, this pond is becoming a a spiritual pursuit now. How, How obedient of us and that we're sacrificing this money to to facilitate Christian community. And uh, now, I think really that's a possibility. You know, if if we're having people over regularly, that that can facilitate uh, Christian community, could build some really good relationships. But there's also the case there where, uh, you know, if we go a year or two, nobody's been over to our house. It's like, what are we really after here? We dress this up uh, so it sounds pretty good. It sounds like, oh, they're, uh, they're being just a, a righteous person seeking after God, when really the intent, we didn't want to have people over. We just wanted a nice property and some luxury and comfort. Uh, the last example I'll, I'll give is uh, our money, how we invest it. And maybe you think, oh, I need to invest some more money uh, so that I have more time to volunteer or to serve other people or so, you know, it'll really free me up to do a lot of work. So I need to start investing more. I think we can tell ourselves that uh, enough that we really start to believe it, that we're doing this for God so that we can serve other people. And, and that's, again, that's uh, case by case is, is different for every person. That may be true, but oftentimes, uh, is it not also possible that we don't want to serve God when we retire much more than we do now? We just want more money. We just want a better retirement. We want our own comfort. And, you know, these are just a a few examples. It it could apply in your life a variety of different ways. But uh, what we're getting at is that we need to be careful when we go to God and tell Him that we're after one thing and the intent of our heart is something completely different. And that's what Jesus is experiencing here. These men come up. Jesus, you're true. You only teach what's right. You only teach what's pleasing to God. You know, if we just saw this in a small snapshot, you'd think these guys are pure-hearted. But when you understand the full context, we see uh, their hearts aren't caring about taxes. Jesus, 12, 15, knowing their hypocrisy, he sees right through it. When we go to him, we say, I need to save more money so I can serve the church. You're a hypocrite. I need to dig this pond so I can build some Christian community. Jesus sees right through it. He knows if our heart is pure or if our heart is not pure. Just as he saw them. Why, why are you testing me, he says, because he already knows what's going on in their heart. So he asks, why are they testing me? Do, do you have a coin? He asks for a coin, you know. Uh, who's... 50 cent piece God brought me yesterday. Whose image is on the coin? Whose likeness is on there? Whose whose inscription is on it? And uh, they see it. It, It's interesting also that Jesus didn't have any money, isn't it? These other people are carrying money. Jesus apparently didn't have any uh, coins on him. He's traveling with nothing. Whose image is on there? What's inscribed on it? And they say, well, it's Caesar's. That's right. It's Caesar's. Give to Caesar. Whatever is Caesar's, this is when it really starts to get good. Jesus is about to give these guys a gut check and gave me a gut check this week too. He answers the question, that's what was asked, should we pay the taxes or not? He answers the question pretty clearly, yeah, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Could have stopped there, right? But he goes on and he adds this last statement, and give to God what belongs to God. Jesus speaks right to the heart of the issue. He may as well have said, I'm I'm not really concerned about taxes. 
What he's telling us is, look, I don't care if you go out with your friends on the weekend. I don't care if you dig the pond. I don't care if you invest some more money. Give the money to Caesar. It's his. Doesn't that answer the question that they have asked? If uh, the money was Caesar's, it would have said Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. And on the back would have been an image of his mother, and it would have said high priest. All over it was marked as Caesar's, and Caesar wanted that money. It belonged to him, and he made uh, all of that pretty clear. So we see what belongs to Caesar. How do we know what belongs to God? Give to God what is God's. What belongs to to God. Turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Many of you know right where we're going. Genesis 1, let's start in verse 24. God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. God saw that it was good. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, over the creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And it goes on. We see, did you catch it? We are created in the image of God. We're to have dominion over everything else. Jesus spoke to this plant to wither and it withered because God was living through him, and he was having dominion and rule over all the creation. So we be sure that uh, God has rule over us, and we give to God what is God's, and that Caesar has no rule over us, that we submit to God, but not to Caesar as we allow him to have what belongs to him. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, we could start at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." They shall no longer, uh, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest. I will write my word on their hearts. Whose inscription was that on the coin? Caesar's. Whose image? Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. You are created in the image of God. His inscription is written on your hearts, the Word of God written on our hearts. These people knew the Old Testament so well, better than any one of us in here. I am sure their minds just went racing back through all the Old Testament, and they thought, oh my goodness, Jesus is speaking to us. Jesus is again turned the tables, and He's putting us on the hot seat. That we can give to Caesar what's his, but we must give to God what's his. And I know that in Genesis chapter 1, it says that I was created in God's image. I know that uh, the, and historically, the uh, prophet Jeremiah, when everybody was in exile, God said, well, I'm going to give them a new law that's written, it's inscribed on their hearts. They heard every bit of that without him saying it. They knew it was true. I think the application for us is twofold. One, you give the world what you must, but you never let the world steal your heart that belongs to God. Two, 
Never exchange Jesus for worldly gain or authority. So church, I don't know where you spend your free time, where you spend your money, how you teach your children. I don't know what your personal goals are, what sins may be threatening your heart. But don't give anything to Caesar that belongs to God. The world might be asking for it, but it's not the world's to have. It belongs to God. And if you're uneasy about going out with your friends, trust God's leading in it. If you're not sure about something you're thinking of buying, pray about it more. If you don't know how much to invest, talk to God about it. See how He directs you. Don't let it steal your heart. When the things of the world start pulling at our heart, it's time to cut it off. Jesus taught that uh, not too far back. It's better to enter life crippled and maimed than into hell with two hands of fully work. If something's pulling at your heart, you cut it off. You don't let it consume you. You don't let it uh, steal you. The Bible's littered with heroes that stand for this, and that's what we're called to stand for. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Daniel. He refused to bow and uh, worship anybody else. He went home and he prayed to his God. He risked his life for it. Daniel 3, just before that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, you're going to bow to these idols or you're going to be thrown into this fire. They said, I don't care. I'm not bowing to your idols. Our God's going to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing to you. They weren't going to give him his, uh, his heart. It belonged to God. Job told to curse God time and again. Curse God and die. Finally, bring yourself some peace. He says, no, I'm not cursing God. This is not God's fault. The apostles, they couldn't help but proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's better to obey God than it is to obey man, they said. So you can see the order. God directs their hearts while still they can submit to men in some ways. Give the world what you must, but never let the world steal your heart that belongs to God. Finally, don't exchange Jesus for worldly gain or authority. Colossians 1, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God. 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of Jesus, who is the image of God. These Pharisees and the Herodians, it was their desire to see Jesus destroyed so that they could preserve their position of authority. They wanted to call the shots. They didn't want to submit to Jesus. They wanted to preserve their power. They exchanged Jesus so they could have their own way. Judas, one of the disciples, exchanges Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Peter exchanged Jesus three times over in the face of fear and shame. The crowds exchanged Jesus for a thief and Barabbas. They could have let the Messiah go free, but they exchanged him. The question asked Jesus was about paying taxes. They were trying to test him. But we can't put Jesus to the test. We can't put God to the test. He cuts right to our hearts. He sees us. He knows what's true. So Jesus, as he was on the hot seat, turns uh, the table, as I said, and he puts those men on there. And as they walk away, they're marveling because they just recognize that they now have a choice to make, not Jesus. They have to decide, am I going to leave here and give myself back to Caesar? Or am I going to leave here and give myself to God? Give your money to Caesar. I don't care. But give your life to God, is what he's asking them. That's a choice that we face as well. Whether it's an option to deny Jesus in our heart, to deny, deny him of our time, to deny him of our money, to deny him of our purity, whatever it is, if it belongs to God, we should render it to God. We cannot allow ourselves to minimize the effects of sin in our life, no matter how big or small. If it belongs to God, it's his, and we need to render it to him. So what about ourselves, our taxes, our vacations, our attitudes, our dating relationships, the images we see on our smartphones, football? What do those surface level issues say about our hearts? Is it starting to 
encroach a little too much? Is it starting to take possession? Proverbs 24, maybe. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. If you belong to God, know today God loves you. He sent his son to die for you, and Jesus lives for you. So offer to him what is his, and to Caesar what is Caesar's. But this week, let's go and offer ourselves to God. Romans 12, it's a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is how we worship. It's how we bring praise and glory to Jesus and all that we do by rendering to God all that is God's. Would you pray with me? Well, Father God, uh, again, we thank you for uh, the gift of your word and God, just the the genius of Jesus, of you to speak through him, through your spirit, uh, what was true. Uh, these men went to a man who spoke what is true and uh, they were thinking they had set him up for destruction and he continued to speak what was true and they recognized they were setting themselves up for destruction. And God, uh, maybe we do it in more subtle ways, but if we're honest, I think sometimes we do that too. We set ourselves up for destruction and we do what's not pleasing to you, and we might even know it. So, God, I just pray today for uh, forgiveness in my own heart, for those here who are uh, feeling the same way, that sometimes we seek our intent that isn't uh, so pleasing to you. Forgive us for that, Lord, and help us to leave this place and to be bold in faith, to, to repent of those things, and, Lord, to find accountability where it's needed. Uh, Lord, maybe there's... Uh, some coins we need to go and retrieve and turn back to you or other areas of our life that belong to you that we're trying to hide. God, we can't hide it. You already see it. So we just ask uh, for you to drive out the, the darkness and the hold that uh, the world may have on us and set us free from that. That's what you came to do, to set us free. So God, I pray that that would just be a reality for every one of us. Uh, let us leave here with joy in our hearts that we belong to you that your word is inscribed on our hearts and that we are children of God. God, no greater thing than knowing that. So just allow us to leave rejoicing over the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, <clears throat> excuse me. As always, invited up for prayer after the service, um, just to, to share a word or receive prayer. Otherwise, you may go. Have a, a blessed week.